it's new to new researchers, new to people who read new research. But when you get into the technology they've been employing for thousands of years, uh, it's many cases the same technology, same programs, same masks. And, and I'm afraid that if we don't evolve and go two or three steps ahead and look at it from a macro lens, we're going to be stuck in this simulation in the dark city, not realizing that they're afraid of us waking up, not afraid of us going to sleep. They're afraid that we're going to wake up one day and realize how powerful we are. I'm here again with Nathaniel Gillis. Now, Nathaniel Gillis was with me before on one of the early shows, and he's with me again tonight. So I'm just going to read out an introduction to Nathaniel. Nathaniel Gillis is a demonologist, author, and lecturer. After living in a haunted house, Nathaniel spent 20 years researching what it was he encountered. Nathaniel has sought to redefine the nature of haunting phenomena ghosts, and high strangeness. As one of the thought leaders in his field, Nathaniel's hypothesis is not that aliens are demons, but that a singular intelligence has worn both as masks in which to hide. In fact, his, in fact he is often quoted for his concept of the phenomenon. The reason they are playing by different rules is because they are playing a different game. So Nathaniel, how are you? I'm doing well, sir, and it's always great to be back on your channel, and uh, I consider you a good friend, and uh, thank you for being kind to me when I, I, I send you annoying messages about research on Instagram, so <laughs> thank you for your kindness to me. And it's my great, work. and it's, I, it's... I, I appreciate your insights when I get them. I always find them very, very <laughs> interesting indeed, and you're very, you. very original and a very um, unique way of looking at things. Nathaniel... We're going to be talking tonight about a movie that you and I like. It's called Dark City. Now, mm -hmm. I, I saw a post on your Instagram the other day about Dark City, and that's what it, it brought. That's why it, it brought it to my mind. I hadn't seen the movie in years. It came out around, I don't know what year. What year did it come out? Ninety, ninety-one, or something? Ninety-seven, around ninety-seven, ninety-nine. Oh, right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We can't tell because the Matrix is was put out right around that time frame, and they're both virtually the same. One had a, a greater production, I guess, a greater production um, balance, uh, and you know, it's they're both the same essentially. And I'm trying to figure out which one came first, right? Even though one was yeah. uh, put a published first, and one was put out in theaters, but you know. Which one is the first one? That's really curious. 98. 98 Dark City mm -hmm. came out. 1998. Wow. Dark, Dark, Dark City and, you know, Jacob's Ladder? I've heard of it, yes. yes. Jacob's Ladder, it reminds me of Jacob's Ladder, that kind of atmosphere, that kind of gloomy, mysterious atmosphere. It's got that whole vibe going on with it. Jacob's Ladder is the same. And um, two great movies. Mm -hmm. So... The movie, I'm just going to, now, this is going to be a spoiler alert because I'm going to be reading out a quick <laughs> synopsis of the movie, right? So anybody who wants, who hasn't seen the movie and who wants to go and see it or see it wherever they watch their movies, you can, you can, you cannot listen to this part. So, okay. So John Murdoch, Rufus Sewell, wakes in a hotel bath, bathtub, suffering from what seems to be amnesia. As he stumbles into his hotel room, he receives a call from Dr. Daniel Schrieber, Kiefer Sutherland, who urges him to flee the hotel from a group of men called the Strangers. During the telephone conversation, John discovers the corpse of a brutalized, ritualistically murdered woman, along with a bloody knife. Murdoch flees the scene just as the Strangers arrive at the room. Eventually, he uncovers his real name and tracks down his wife, Emma, Jennifer Connolly. He's also sought for a series of murders, which he cannot remember, by police inspector Frank Umstead, William Hurt. Murdoch stays on the move in the city, which experiences perpetual night. He sees people fall comatose at the stroke of midnight, and he is pursued by the strangers. In the chase, he discovers that he has psychokinetic powers like the strangers, which he uses to escape from them. 
Murdoch questions the dark urban environment and discovers through clues and interviews with his family that he was originally from a coastal town called Shell Beach. Attempts at finding a way out of the city to Shell Beach are hindered by lack of reliable information. Meanwhile, the strangers, disturbed by the presence of a human who retains their powers, which they refer to as tuning, inject one of their men, Mr. Hand, Richard O'Brien, with Murdoch's lost memories in an attempt to track down Murdoch. Constantly on the run, Murdoch witnesses the strangers altering the city's landscape and people's identities during the still period at midnight, during which time everyone is unconscious. Murdoch eventually meets Bumstead, who recognizes Murdoch's innocence and has his own questions about the nature of the dark city. They find and confront Dr. Schrieber, who explains that the strangers are endangered alien parasites with a collective consciousness who are experimenting on humans to analyze the nature versus nurture concept of their human hosts in order to survive. Schrieber reveals Murdoch as an anomaly who inadvertently woke up during the midnight process with the ability to tune. The three men embark to find Shell Beach, which ultimately exists only as a billboard, billboard at the edge of the city. Frustrated Murdoch tears, excuse me, frustrated Murdoch tears through the wall, revealing a hole into deep space. The men are confronted by the strangers, including Mr. Hand, who holds Emma hostage. In the ensuing fight, Umstead falls through the hole into space, revealing the city as an enormous space habitat surrounded by a force field. The strangers bring Murdoch to their home beneath the city and force Dr. Schrieber to imprint Murdoch with their collective memory. Schrieber, having worked for the strangers, betrays them by instead inserting memories in Murdoch that train his tuning abilities. Murdoch awakens, fully realizing his abilities, breaks free and battles with the strangers, defeating the leader, Mr. Book, Ian Richardson, in a battle high above the city. Utilizing his newfound powers, Murdoch begins reshaping the city, returning the sun, flooding the areas surrounding the city with water and forming mountains and beaches, creating the actual Shell Beach. The strangers who survived Mr. Book's death retreat from the sunlight to die underground. On his way to Shell Beach, Murdoch encounters Mr. Hand and informs him that the strangers have been searching in the wrong place, the head, to understand humanity rather than obviously the heart. Murdoch opens the door leading out of the city and steps into sunlight for the first time. Beyond him, is, is a dock where he finds Emma, now with, now with new memories and a new identity as Anna, with no recollection of Murdoch. They reintroduce and walk, they reintroduce and walk to Shell Beach, beginning their relationship anew. So there's a lot going on in that movie. There's a lot, there's a lot of symbology, obviously, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of stuff going on there. What what do you make of it? What what are your insights into the movie? Um, oh. It's heavy, my friend, it's heavy. What's so funny is when you mentioned, like you, you watched it a long time ago, I never did. I was a kid when it was released. And so I can remember uh, being in my grandmother's basement watching TV, but seeing the VHS um, in their uh, TV counter. I'm just looking at it thinking, okay, what is that? The older I became, the more I got interested in it and finally watched it. And it blew my mind because it coincides deeply with what we are learning about the phenomenon. I mean, an invasive species that wants to monitor our memories and our beliefs. Uh, there was one part that is alarming in the, in the movie because uh, one of them says to the other, he is becoming like us, so we must become like him. How do we become like him? And then they would, they would begin to imprint their memories and, and just stretch their consciousness into these individuals. And then the individual, it's incredible. I mean, the very first part of the movie the gentleman wakes up and i think that's indicative of we what we have to do in the field is to wake up even more than that so uh, they were playing wake, with consciousness. Wake, wake up to what nate what wake up to what exactly right wake up to the reality that there is something going on 
that uh, there's more mm. to what we're experiencing than meets the eye. And that was one of the most troubling aspects of the field was that they were blinding him by his own vision. He saw it and therefore he believed what he saw was real. Even more than that, uh, they, it was not what they wanted him to remember that was the most important. It was what they wanted him to forget. And as long as they could keep messing with his mind and messing with his memory, they had the utmost control over him, what he believed to exist. And so that's what they would do. And, and even by definition, tuning is to take something that is and to change it according to their will and to their desire. And so the deeper I got into that movie, I just, I've watched it, rewatched it. And finally I thought, oh my God, like even uh, when they murdered people and tried to pin it on the main character, they would carve symbols into the skin and the symbol itself. And I'm not big into symbolism, but the symbol itself is just, it's a circle. It goes down it's just like you're being hypnotized and when you ask Ale when they asked Alex Rojas what he believed and, and why he implemented that symbol it was it was because it was almost like the wheel of souls uh it's another interconnectivity the wheel of souls is uh in uh the, the uh, Golan Heights in Israel and uh, the wheel of souls is called the Gilgal Raphaim and it's designed that way because it symbolizes reincarnation which is exactly what this species of being was doing, where that, that's why also there they were there were corpses, they were pale in complexion, they had no souls, and the, the parasite in them was using their bodies as a biological avatar. So in this entire it's one movie we have possession, we have everything we ever wanted, um, but more than that, these these beings had the ability to create their own reality, or to to simulate a reality and then to to take us into that world and and it's very it's much like uh the adjustment bureau and it's not dissimilar to what we hear from a lot of experiencers who say listen they'll take you at will they'll play with your memory they'll measure your beliefs and if if there's something off with with your perception of them they will step into another role just as long as we do not really understand who they are, what they're doing, and what their purpose is. Uh, it, it's a very troubling movie, once you, especially if you're doing the research like I'm, it's like, oh my God, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but it, it, more than anything, it does speak to a parasitic entity that is using us as a species to self-replicate its own. You know, in the movie as well, as you said, They've got access to, to the thinking, to the thoughts of people. And it's like what you say in your research that the phenomena that we're dealing with nowadays ourselves, they have access to our innermost um, thoughts as well. They can, they can manipulate the way we think or feel to a certain extent. Do you, do you see similarities in that sense? Absolutely, 100%. And it's glaring. But it's deeply troubling. Uh, I tell this Dr. Collar Turner in her book Taken. She talks about an experiencer she worked with, who was at a uh, a barbecue with her friends, and they saw a UFO hovering across the street. And uh, this experiencer said said to Dr. Collar Turner, "I vividly remember looking through my binoculars and pulling out my telescope, and even more than that, hand, handing my telescope and handing my binoculars to friends, and we're all astounded. We're all excited." She said, "The problem is the next day I woke up." and my telescope was still in the Amazon box that I bought it from. Or, yeah, I won't. It, even more than that, she didn't own binoculars. And did she dream that, or did she, did she dream that, or did she actually uh, experience it in, in, her, she, in her waking? She, she, ex she experienced it in waking consciousness. But even, even in waking consciousness, just by observing the phenomenon, it had access to what she believed she saw. And so this is another, it's a very, it's troubling because the, the power mechanism that is employed, the, the control mechanism that is in, employed, we don't know how much access we have to it. We don't know how much access they have to us. Uh, it, it gets back to this idea, okay, even in waking consciousness, yes, you see me, but I have the ability not just to cause you to see something different, but I'm going to influence the way you interpret 
what you've seen of me. It's, it's very, very troubling because this gets back to the aspect of deception. If this is not a threatening species, then why is deception being employed most of the time? And in you that period of... Mm -hmm. okay. no, continue, please. Even in that period uh, that we're talking about, the question that I've, I've been asking myself relentlessly is what are they wanting her to forget? What else have they done to this woman? or even to her friends, right? That they're hiding behind simply by employing this, this masked memory or this, this figment of imagination, simulation, whatever we want to call it. The point being uh, that she did not have access to what really happened. And even the thoughts that she remembered, they were literally implanted and were not real. That, like that's what we're doing. Yeah, it's like in the movie where they all like fall asleep at midnight and, you know, they wake up and their their thoughts have been like one one guy in the movie is working in a hotel. And the next time he's working in a, at a stand selling papers and he right. thinks he's he'd be, he's been there for 25 years. The guy, mm -hmm. the guy in the movie as well, um, Bumstead, you know, Bumstead, the, the detective, he's almost mm -hmm. like um, he almost kind of represents the public in a as as some people call them the normies um uh, where <laughs> where they're under like this kind of like uh hypnosis where they think just um, you know, th things are are what they see what they seem to be so mm -hmm. you you mentioned a lot about masks in your research can you go deeper into masks what's your understanding of masks and how does it how does it um how does it apply to your research so there is this theory of them playing roles when we encounter them. Uh, and, and in my field, I, I, my research even, I've experienced this in my own world. Personally, I've worked with experiencers of incubi cases and of aliens, so-called aliens. And it, most of them are masks. Um, I, I've been on shows before where, where even before we record, the host themselves, they say, hey, listen, I had an experience and I'm pretty sure the being itself used a cloak. It was a, it was a mask and it lied to me by virtue of its appearance. Um, I did a show not too long ago where the gentleman uh, had broken up with a girlfriend. This has been like 10, 15 years ago. But once, you know, you know how it is, once the research starts getting out there, people get, oh my God, that makes sense. I have to come forward with my story. He said about 15 years ago, he said, uh, before he met his wife, before he had children, he had broken up with a girlfriend of his moved across town, got a new job, changed his number, all of that. And he said it had been like six or seven months. They didn't even have the same friends anymore. They're just living life. And uh, he said one night he gets off work, he's drinking a beer and, you know, watching TV and he gets a knock at his door. He opens the door and it's his ex-girlfriend that he has not talked to, has not seen in months. And uh, she comes in, they have a physical encounter Everything seemed real. This is, again, this gets back to uh, Dark City. Everything, all of his senses were fulfilled. Every role reality should play in his, his perception, it played that role. And, and then he said he woke up in the middle of the night and it was like nobody was there. Nobody had been there. So he thought, okay, she, she may have to work early tomorrow or whatever, no big deal. So he goes to work the next day. Something did not feel right. He kept questioning in the back of his mind, was that real? Did that actually occur to me? It made no sense. So then he asks, he asks himself, he said, uh, it's just like, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep referring to this movie, man. It's going to be, it's, once it fits, it's like, wait a minute. He asks himself, well, how did she even know where I live? And so he still remembered her number by memory. So he dials her number in his phone. He asks her a question, you know, you came over last night, we had whatever, and uh, you left prematurely, didn't even say goodbye. And I just wanna ask you like, you know, I haven't seen you in months, I haven't talked to you in months, how did you even know where I lived? And she cursed him out. That wasn't me. You know it's not me, I would never do that. And you need to block me and never call me again. I'm tired of this, don't ever contact me again. Hung up the phone and he's like, Nathaniel, what was that in my bedroom? I have another case, just cases everywhere like that. Um, what, imp what, imp what impact did that have on him? On his, it on just his changed his world. Like, again, 
when we're dealing with the, the, the level of deception, it's, it's, it's easy, easier for us when we know we're deceived or we're, we know we're being deceived in the act. Uh, it's much harder for us to rationalize after the fact, because then again, our world le makes less and less sense to us. How did they have that much access? How would they know what I would be willing to believe? How did they have access to my mind, my memories, my belief systems? Um, and I'm gonna go into a couple more case studies then I'm gonna get back to them measuring our belief, which is something that is a very nuanced hypothesis but I'm telling you, it's glaringly obvious once we get into the data. I did another show and uh, was talking about EQBI cases that I've, I've had and researched. A woman reached out and uh, she heard I was going to be on the show. She goes, okay, I got to talk to Nathaniel before the show and give him my encounter. She said that one night she was laying in bed and her husband uh, walked to the side of the bed and uh, basically got fresh or you can edit that out, you know, um, and uh, they had a physical encounter. And after all, everything was said and done, she said the, her husband got off of the bed and stood right where he was before the encounter and just stared at her. She said that's when she realized that she was in some kind of funk. That there was almost a, this, this stupor that she was coming out of, just like the man in the beginning of Dark City. And then she's looking at her husband as he's staring back at her, and then she starts to realize that there are facial features that this being was manifesting that were not necessarily with what belonged to her husband of 30 years. Then she realized that this was a mask the phenomenon had worn in order to gain access to her body and to her belief system. And when she called it out, then it changed its shape, turned into a smoky apparition, flew out of the hallway to the hallway. That is at the point when she turned around and saw that her husband had put, been put to sleep right next to her in the bed. Now, she already knew that's where her husband was, but the phenomenon had contorted itself and her perception of reality. Now, I can go deep with this. The inducing into a dream state is not new to the research. It's due to ufologists, uh, but to people who study the phenomenon of biblical antiquity in Mesopotamia, even incubi cases, we know that in, in many, many accounts, they will induce us into a dream state because they do, because it's almost like, again, it's not just I'm playing a role, but I'm going to, to assist you in your ability to believe in me. Now, this gets back into this idea, okay, it's not just that I'm going to play the role, there is this role-playing phenomenon where uh, I, myself and my colleagues are trying to understand what's really going on. See, if I have all access to you, I can just do whatever I want to, take whatever I want to, without your knowledge, without your approval, without your permission. But what is the purpose of me playing a role in your perception? Unless it is to gain some kind of consent or to, to measure your belief in me. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. Do you believe I am who I am appearing to you as? And if you do, are they looking at that as what I call the, a, a protocol of belief, where now it is a license to have access because you believe I am who I am appearing to you as? And when this belief manifests, it becomes something tangible, something you can touch, feel, obviously. So how how can you explain that? It's not just something. It's not just something that's psychic. It's something that's actually right. physical. Correct. Uh, Father Sinestro of Amino was collecting semen samples from cases just like what we're referring to tonight, actual semen samples. So it's almost as if, and I've seen this in Ikebai cases too. Where in succubus, even uh, where the individual, because they think it's just a dream, right? It's easier for them to consent to the entity. It's just a nightmare anyway. I'm going to wake up from this. None of this is real. When in fact, it is real. There is something physical in the room. And, and this gets back to this okay, Sinestrari, again, these beings would manifest to women in their dreams, allegedly. And, and then they would be accosted, assaulted, um, uh, tortured even. They, and then they would wake up the next day 
And, and like I su suggested earlier, we're okay, it's, it's just a dream, no word, no worries, we're all good. We can go back to work or we're all fine. Not realizing that as the day progresses, the sun rises and sets, they have ligature marks on their wrists. So that what so so in antiquity in demonology, especially in our demonological texts, those were called dream demons. Now, here's what's most interesting. What, what used to be called dream demons and what used to be thought of as just nightmares, now we're realizing that the dream itself is some form of technology being employed when we're in their presence, right? And I, I hope I'm, this is making sense. I'll go back into my own personal testimony. Years ago, I was working second ship at a, uh, an engine plant here in Ohio. And uh, I got home one night, it was a Friday night, and uh, just, you know, took a hot shower, hot shower, cold beer. It's awesome. And I, I get to bed and only had one beer, mind you. I was really tired. So I get to bed and my fiance at the time, she's already in bed sleeping. And uh, instantly I go into this deep REM sleep. And it was weird. It was unlike any other dream I've ever had in my life. Because in this dream state, it wasn't just me. There was an entity with me in that dream and so in the dream I, I i'm looking at this being that has mounted me one leg is here and it mounted me and it's staring at me like this and when i'm looking in the dream i'm looking at this entity it looked like my fiance if you would have put her in in a room and turn all the lights off featureless but long hair the same body type same very, very you know small and and I'm looking at this being, and in the dream, I'm trying to fight her off. As I'm trying to fight her off, I'm hitting my fiance. Is this you? Is this you? And instantly, I woke myself up, and I, to my astonishment, it was still in the room. It was present in this world. And then my fiance looked up and said, what is that? But my point being that dreams, again, they employ Hold on, did, 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 you, did your fiance see this thing? Yes, 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 she did. And was it still, was it, was it still standing it was, on the bed? It, Where yes, was it? It, it was mounting me. And then when she saw it, she said, what is that? She did, it wasn't even who. It was just, what is that? What is that? And then the being took one leg, just like a human would, one leg over off the bed and just faded into the darkness. So what we used to believe uh, in demonology, okay, it's a dream demon. It's a demon that enters the dream. Now, because we, you know, we're no longer compartmentalizing the phenomenon, what we're realizing is, okay, what used to be a dream demon that enters in the dreams is now a being that's inducing us into the dream it's entering. That's incredible. And so now that we're starting to see beyond the veil enough to realize, okay, what are we really dealing with here? Again, now, now getting back to the, the dream demons and the incubi, succubi, and alien abduction stuff, uh, there's a reason why they're staring into our eyes. This, okay, this is a pervasive thematic element in the field. And, and David Jacobs is a great researcher. He suggests that they're hacking the optic nerve. I agree. Let's go deeper since we're questioning reality, right? Since we're questioning if what is going on is actually real or not, there is a part of our brain directly behind our eyes. It's the media frontal orbital cortex. It is the part of our brain that tells us whether or not the movie we're watching is real. So there is a measure of them hacking our belief systems presenting itself as real as possible as the illusion. And yet what is actually beyond the mask, we are completely ignorant to. So the mask is your, your suggestion. You're suggesting that the mask is both demons and aliens, that they're yes, actually the masks them, themselves or masks of, of the phenomena. So what is... Yeah. The phenomena. What is it? I think it is parasitic in nature. I can't give them a title. Well, I do. I call them molters, uh, simply because they are parasitic in nature. 
And there is this, this fad right now in the field that wants to hypothesize that uh, they cannot be a threat to us because they're, they, that we are alive and they haven't just annihilated us. I think that if we look through the prism in which I hypothesize, uh, if they are parasites, the goal of the parasite is not to kill the host. Even let's be maybe deeper. The goal of the parasite is not just to find a host. The goal of the parasite is to survive. And if we're looking at, I'm sorry, go ahead. So hence the reason why they haven't destroyed us, I guess, centuries ago or whenever yeah, they go. Absolutely. Now we're looking again, we're looking at a species that has to self-replicate through us in order to survive. Now, now we're getting into some very, very dark waters here. Uh, if we look at what they're doing in the hybridization program, it is parasitic. Uh, we have evidence that the book phenomenon 16th century that they're not just creating hybrids in the womb, but they're placing their own consciousness in them, which would be that self-replicating mechanism we're referring to tonight. They cannot destroy the womb that births them. Does it mean they're not a threat to us? It means that they are the parasite, we are the hosts, and they need us to survive. Now, this is why I've couched my entire hypothesis, not just in, in modernity, but even in Mesopotamian texts. Because in antiquity, our ancestors were experiencing uh, a, a species, not just of a demonic, the species of death, right? And they were they're called Nephilim or men of renown that have replicated their own consciousness in the wombs of women. And then, and then all of a sudden, right, they have a body to inhabit and they exist. Now, we see this, this, this understanding all throughout uh, Witcher literature, all throughout uh, texts of sorcery. Uh, matter of fact, one text is called the Red Rite, and it was, it was an incantation. It was a ritual where you could, these magi, magicians, when they were nearing death, just like a parasite, they would go and they would inseminate a woman with the fetus. Hello, UFO abduction. And hold on, brother. Sorry, I had, a, I had a phone call come in, and we can uh -huh. edit that out. But, but uh -huh. then in the, middle, in the middle of this incantation, they would inseminate the woman. That's what we would call that ikimai. See, again, what we're realizing very quickly is that we've compartmentalized the phenomenon into screenshots of a moving theme. If we saw what's really going on like, it, like it, we should, it, they're just different aspects of it, different perspectives. But anyways, it would simulate a woman with the fetus, and then it would transfer his own consciousness into that fetus. Now, the, the, the parasite has a new host. And what we're seeing are these ufologists and other people that are familiar with this, this literature. Well, if they're a threat, they would kill the host. Wrong way to look at it. Wrong way to look at it. The, the parasite's trying to survive. As long as the host does, the parasite does as well. And so I think it more than anything, I can't place a real name on them, but I could tell you that they are more like a parasite than any humans. So in a way, uh, Nace, that gives them a certain privilege, a certain power over us, almost mm -hmm. to a degree where they're more elevated spiritually, if, if I can use that term here, with them. They're more, they're, they're above us. If, if, if they're using us as a, mm -hmm. You know, to feed off, they've got a certain degree of power over us. So, would you would you consider us below them? Would you consider us having any power to to prevent them from from entering our fields? At this point, I'm I'm looking at religious amulets playing some role, um, but in my own opinion, in my humble opinion, not the role that we believe they play. Uh, you know, and I think that in a way that the phenomenon had not only masks itself, but it has employed propaganda to where we would believe in one mask, where we would believe in one rule that they're supposed to play. Meanwhile, they're transcending that microcosm. Does that make sense? I mean, for instance, Carmen Snedeker had a case in Montague, Connecticut, and, uh, you know, we were told by the Catholic Church and other traditions, okay, if you employ the cross, they'll stop. Um, that's very rarely true. 
Matter of fact, even if you look at, I was reading the statistics the other day, even the Catholic exorcism, the average time is a year and a half for it to be successful. A year and a half. And the, just going to talk and just going to say it out there, put it out there, guys. If we meet an entity in the middle of the night, we do not have a year and a half. Right. So, again, I mean, it was Carmen Snedeker. Uh, the priest came in, in her house and said, okay, if you want to remove the entity, you need to place a cross on top of the door frame. Go to bed at night. It will never enter that room. That is a law we were told they follow. Well, she wakes up the next day. The cross is flown across the hallway, the entity is now in the room. Now, at what point are research, and I come from evangelical modernity, and they say all of the, at what point are we going to be honest with the data and say, hey, listen, maybe they lie to us. Maybe they're the ones that want us to believe they follow these laws. Meanwhile, right? Okay, yeah, the, the hook, the hoodwink us here. Meanwhile, what they're really doing is beyond the veil. Now, the reason I suggest this, and I, I hope I'm doing, I hope I'm making sense tonight. But the reason I suggest this is because I had a case of my own where a remote viewer was leaving his body and meeting beings. And, and when he no longer complied with their plan, they put him back into his body. He had a massive coronary at the hospital. He, they saw his family took his, his shirt off. They saw three subdermal religious annulets moving from underneath the skin to the surface in all of them were religious, and none of them made any sense when they're placed together. None. One was the Star of David. The other one was the cross that Jesus died on. The other, another one, the last one was an arching Egyptian hieroglyphic. So if they do work, and they do work sometimes, I'm not sure and I'm not even confident that we know why. Because the way they're employing them against us, it's almost an act of sorcery. It's not something an extraterrestrial would employ, right? It, it's something different. It's something more alien than alien, something more demonic than demonic. And that's my position at this moment, that, that they're wearing both masks because they do not want us to understand what's going on. You know, in the movie, it's when um, John's ability, you know, he's in the dark city, he discovers he's... Um psychokinetic powers while he's mm -hmm. trying to evade these the strangers so what what have you discovered about yourself when you're when you're i wouldn't i, I don't want to say the word evading this phenomenon mm -hmm. but dealing with this phenomenon researching this what what have you discovered about yourself well i think that we are a lot more perceptive than we believe we are there's a reason why they do not have total access to us without playing roles or without wearing a mask. And I think that this has a lot more to do with us and our spiritual condition, our soul, if you will, uh, than they would like us to believe. Now we're getting into, to, okay, like how, where, from where are they gathering their information, right? Uh, we, and I'm going to get to your, to answer your question in a second, but there is a soulish dimension present in these encounters. Whatever we're encountering, it fits the bill of a spirit inhabiting a body, not an ET. It ha I mean, if you look at their behavioral patterns, we knew them as spirits in antiquity because these spirits would walk through walls but solidify to the touch. We knew this as apparitional theory before we knew them as ET. Now, I'm gonna suggest something as well. The same intelligence that told us that it was a demon is now telling us it's an alien. And the evidence that I would like to put forward are the behavioral patterns throughout history, the symbolism carved into skin, the way that they pull the body out the soul out of the body, like they did in dream demonology, and then place it back in the body. The same, same behavioral patterns, the same interest, all of them are here. The evidence suggests that we're being lied to. Now, I will also employ this. Uh, Sybil Leak was being investigated by the Collins Elite physicist from the Department of Defense. Sybil Leak was a contemporary to Aleister Crowley. She would live in the United Kingdom, and in many, many times, many times of the night, Aleister Crowley would come knock on her cottage, say, hey, I'd like to talk to you about my research. She said, all right, and so he would, he would employ incantations, perform rituals, and so finally, when she moved from the UK to Los Angeles, California, now Collins Elite, they're knocking on her door, and their intentions with her were very clear. 
They ask Sibali, can you talk to, conjure and contact the beings that Alistair Crowley was in contact with? It's possible. She said, well, she said, I've never tried that, but I'll contact my guides and I will see if I can contact them through them. So essentially she goes through her ritual routine, instantly bypassing the guides, something has commandeered Sybil Leak's body. And now she's leaning back in the chair and the being is looking around the room at these physicists. First question, are you an extraterrestrial? <laughs> it laughed. They, they, they asked they asked her this Absolutely. or who asked Absolutely. that question? Okay, so what happened was yes, the researchers first of all asked the entities, are you who uh, who Alistair Crowley conjured? They said indeed we are. The second question they asked the entity, then are you extraterrestrial? And they were verbally abused. It sneered, it mocked them. Are you kidding me? Physicists. You're asking me if I'm an extraterrestrial. Of course we're not. This is our latest deception. What are we dealing here with? Like, what are you dealing with? with here? Right? It, it makes no sense until you really see the pieces and you realize that, okay, you know, I mean, what is Crowley doing employing incantations and conjuring aliens? Unless there's an interdimensionality to this. He conjured one up. I think he, his drawing was the first picture of a gray, was it not? Lamb, I think it was called. Similar. Very similar. Very similar. And even that makes no sense, uh, Michael. It makes no sense because here behind me, I have a book by Abramelin the Mage. And Abramelin the Mage was a Kabbalistic magician. And so he rooted all of his incantations and prayers into the fear of Elohim and Yahweh. He actually, he actually uh, published a caveat. If you do not believe in love and if you don't have fear of God, these incantations will not work. And then Abraham and the Mage passed that literature on to a guy named Eliphas Levi. Eliphas Levi, a Kabbalistic magician, again, rooted in the faith of God, rooted in keeping the Sabbath. These were not incantations to them. These were prayers. Now, the problem here is when Alistair Crowley got a hold of these, a broken incantation conjured something out there. And as Rudolf Otto, the great theologian, said, is wholly other than. And so that's why I believe us as researchers, at least in ufology, we're, we're groping in the darkness because we cannot properly place a face on the phenomenon. Why? Because we have not seen that proto-intelligence yet. What we have seen are masks that it's employed to hide from us. Do you think they're trying to lead us down a wrong spiritual path? Ooh, I can tell you this. They do measure belief. And I'm not talking about just, okay, do you believe I am who I appear to be? That's one aspect of the research. I'm talking about a deeper dimension of faith. Uh, we have experiencers where I, I'm working with one right now where uh, she was being taken in as a kid. And she's like, you know, I didn't even watch movies. I just watched cartoons. And she said that uh, when she was abducted, it manifested to her as a cartoon being. And so she went through the whole ordeal, right? They experimented on her. She's flying, all that. And then, but, but she's, she's being taken by like Mickey Mouse and by cartoon characters. And she said, but they, they were monitoring her fertility. They were doing everything that you would usually see in abduction accounts. But she said that it got to a certain point when she realized that she grew a couple inches, but the entity still manifested as a cartoon. So she's growing, but the entity is not. That's the mask. That's the mask, it, right? It's, it stays the same size because it, it's the mask. So anyways, she realized, okay, there's something wrong with this picture. I'm mature now. You know, I don't even watch those cartoons anymore. And when she when she thought that in her head, suddenly she said its eyes began to shift. And I said, what was it doing? She said, it was measuring my literacy and my belief. 
And she said, then after that, if it did return, never a cartoon, something completely different. So there is a measure of this. And this I need everybody to, to catch this. This is incredible. They evolve in order to evade. They evolve in order to evade. What 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 do you mean by that exactly? Well, not exactly, but yeah. can you can you be more specific? Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, if okay, so if we're looking at the way they manifest to us, especially even in this case study, okay, if the individual out believed or grew out of that little uh, microcosm of cartoons, next thing you know, it measured. She no longer believes this. He's questioning. So then it, it mutated and evolved. And then the next time it manifests, okay, I'm no longer, that's a new mask. We're good. It makes sense. It's something completely different. And it's, it's, like all, a, it's like a micro version of what Jack Vallee suggests with um, mm -hmm. the whole phenomena evolving in that sense and in, in a cultural level. 100%, 100%. And, and in a way it has evolved according to our awareness of it where, okay, we're aware of this certain UFO. And so it plays that role. It's just, it's just like the idea with Ken Obono, well, I saw flying saucers. It's not what he said, but we've seen flying saucers. You see, this is, it's again, it's pervasive in these case studies. Oh, it's a flying saucer. Why is it a flying saucer? So there's this aspect of what do you believe I am? And then it employs in much of what we believe into that masking mechanism um, years ago, my, my brother was uh, a part of a, a group of researchers that were uh, placing cameras throughout the Utah Basin. And uh, I'm talking thousands. They were trying to capture portals, you know, whatever we could, whatever they could. And uh, he was showing me pictures of what they, what they collected. One photograph, this is, this is very scary. One photograph, uh, if you zoomed out on it, it looked just like a plane, just like a plane. Like the naked eye, you and I would be driving in our car and think, okay, wow, that's a Cessna. That's a Cessna. The problem is when they zoomed in on it, it was not a, it was not a plane. It was a, almost like a biological entity. And it's going to blow your mind. This is where we are, though. And when they slowed the footage down, what it manifested as here and, and what it contorted itself as here were completely and categorically different it had contorted itself in the image of a plane but what they were what they believed at that time was they were looking at a biological organic entity that was playing the role of a plane now <laughs> i can go on and on man i don't know how much time we have no no you 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 keep doing what you, you keep you keep going on it's, it's great did you ever see that footage of the ufo over turkey it's um yes and when they, they did a, yeah, they did a close up and they could see the two figures in the, in the windows. What do you make of that? Do you think that's just an illusion? Do you think it's their manifest? I don't know. I don't know. You know, uh, I, I read some literature suggesting it was the very tip top of a yacht, and what you they clipped it. So what you saw was that circular round uh, craft, and then you saw the two people, which you would see in the top of a yacht. I don't know. Um, but even more than that, there are cases where the UFO manifests and there are rivets and screws in it, which we know could not last an inner spatial travel. Mm -hmm. We don't even have those on our airplanes. But there is, again, is there, there's a measure of performance occurring where it's okay, yeah, I'm going to do this, but again, I don't have it all right. You know what I mean? I don't have it all right. And if you look close enough, you'll figure that out, that this is just another manifestation. Not unlike the woman who saw her husband, but when she focused long enough, she said, uh, wait a minute, there are certain things off. Because the mask itself is not perfect if you know what to look for. And I think that's where we're at in the field is we're learning how to test the spirits. And we're, we're hoping we know what to look for in these encounters.
What do you think about the whole disclosure movement at the moment? There's a lot of stuff coming out. You put on the news and nearly every week there's yeah. something else, you know, something big announcement. Although there, people aren't reacting to it in, in the way that you would expect. You know, it's not like, even though it's on the news, people are kind of, uh, have got this kind of, well, a shrug of the shoulder attitude towards it. It's like they become, um, they become immune to it. What do you think of the whole disclosure movement at the moment? I'm... I'm not a uh, I'm not a Greer fan. Uh, we'll talk about CE5 in a second. But I think disclosure is going to be limited, very limited. Uh, there are many reasons for that. Um, I think that in other people, uh, Sean Cahill even echoed the same sentiment, said that once our government tells the millions of experiencers that they really did get taken because that's what that's what it's going to amount to at the end of the day and that's what they're realizing if i admit that there are entities within our airspace uh, that we that have absolute superiority over us then i'm going to have to tell that lady that takes my order at mcdonald's that hey listen they are here we cannot stop them in what you're experiencing is legitimate and when the, it's one thing for us to acknowledge it it's another thing for the world superpowers to say hey listen we have a significant problem because it's not just technological advancement we're dealing with it's an existential ontological threat where literally okay where's my kid right now i can't find them and when the government finds out okay well you know that, and that's what sean k was saying is it to admit one thing is to admit to another and they don't want to admit to the other therefore they won't admit to the one thing so it's a very interesting uh, period in history that we're in why don't you like stephen greer why, why why don't you believe in what he's doing i will say this um because i believe that again there's a movement right now that wants to suggest that what we're dealing with is a, is a new species that has a new origin and, and what they're doing, even if they don't realize what they're doing, is by saying that it's a new phenomenon, then there is a new origin, which means I don't even have to study the past because it just arrived today, right? I'm not responsible for the accounts in, in history. It's in modernity. This is a new phenomenon. And forget all that. Now we have this. And by doing that, uh, what that does is it removes him from the intellectual responsibility of researching in the 16th century when this when people went out in cornfields and tried to conjure the other now it, it's so interesting because in in the, the goop phenomenon this is so fascinating because when i read it i thought man if i teach this or lecture on this they're going to think i made it up because it fits so it fits so tightly together it's interwoven but these individuals of the 16th century believed that what they were dealing with were deceased ancestors Right, not on, not unlike Ted Rice and his grandmother when they were abducted, and the entity wanted to sleep with the grandmother, she wouldn't sleep with anybody but her husband, and so they manifested as a deceased ancestor, her husband. See the danger here, and so in the 16th century they thought they were conjuring deceased loved ones, and so we were going to gain access. They're going to give us insight into our our existence, and next thing you know, women are waking up in the middle of the night. They're, they're being haunted. There's something, there's something doing things to them. And, and this is when we get into the, you know, the dream demons and the hybridization program. And so they became the mortal portal, not the Ouija boards, right? And, and they weren't performing prayers. They were performing rituals. Now, I'm working with two different women right now that follow. See, again, if it's the same phenomenon, it manifests the same way. I'm working with two different women that follow these CE5 protocols. And they're, what they're employing is no different than rituals. It's just to term it differently, and it's okay. And now what they're experiencing is something completely different. They're experiencing full-blown apparitions manifesting to them during their performances and their incantations. Do we really have any idea? See, even deeper than this, in the 16th century, they realized something that we're, we've yet to understand. It wasn't us conjuring them. They were conjuring us. 
And then once we started knocking on their door, what did that mean to them? Now I have access. Now I can step in. And so I, I don't like that aspect of it. I also, uh, he's, he's saying that they're not a threat. They're, they're different things. I don't, I, I don't know them personally. I'm dealing with the ideologies present here. And again, this idea that, and it's pervasive, if I can snip the time frame and edit the film, then I could say this has a new origin. But if we include history as our teacher and as our schoolmaster, then it opens up uh, some, some darker possibilities that I think we need to at least be aware of. So when you see videos of Stephen Greer and his um, yeah. followers, uh, you know, Next on airports, yeah, and, 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 you know, meditating on a beach, trying to yeah. um, conjure or to, to uh, invoke these beings, if you want to call them that, you think that their curiosity is, is misguided, to say the least? Misguided and a little bit disingenuous. If we're going to do it, let's not do it 500 feet or 500 yards or five, 20 miles away from an airport. And if there is a flight path where planes are up there, don't tell the people that those are UFOs when they can go back to the airport reports and say, hey, listen, where were these? Oh, yeah, we were right over you. And then charge them $500 for it. Now, this is what I'm talking about. And I'm, I, you know, but what, what are we doing here? It's like when I, when I stopped doing cleansings, you know, I was in some, I was in one home or trip place and I realized, okay, Thankfully, I survived. Thankfully, it was successful. But what was I really dealing with? <laughs> what was that entity? You know, and I think that's where we are right now. Uh, we don't know what they are. We know that they wear masks. We know they can manipulate. We know that they're the ones, I mean, if they're responding to incantations and not to NASA probes, right? What are we dealing with? If we go out in space and we have, it's like Steve Mara said, it's empty. What's that? But when we come down into houses, they're walking through walls. <laughs> so we, we have to understand that there is a spiritual element here. Well, they have bodies. This is what I've also heard. Um, well, they have bodies and therefore they can't be spirits. And I think, you know, again, there's a lot of people that want to straw man this argument. They, they, do not have, they do not have the intellectual awareness of biblical antiquity, Mesopotamian text, apparitional theory, none of that. They don't even have the information base to pull from. So because of that, they have to, okay, well, they can't be this. And so they line up the straw man theory because it's easier for them to knock it down. Does it make sense? You're following me. Yeah. I don't want to ramble. Yeah, I know I'm rambling. No, no, you're, I'm, 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 you're coherent and I, I'm listening to everything you're saying you're talking there about information and when you were mentioning about the information that people have i was reminded again of the movie and in the movie um the guy what's his name in the movie um john uh, murdoch yeah when murdoch. He, he yeah he's all when he's he's always he's always curious about his identity and this um shell beach and the thing that the thing that stops him from reaching it always is a lack of information and I guess Correct. it's I, I guess it's it's indicative of us as well. I think that is something that that stops us from seeing this, this phenomena uh, mm -hmm. in its true self is a lack of information. I guess, or you know, it it it, it basically is is connected in that sense. When you're Absolutely. what what bothers you the most about this? What like in when you when you're looking at this whole thing? What bothers you? Uh, what keep what keeps you awake at night? If if it keeps you awake, oh, I had a really bad night the other night. Uh, the access they have to us. Um, I mean, if we're dealing with a species that can literally, and I hate using that word, I hate people that use it like that, literally. But I'm doing it. Literally simulate near death experiences. We have an issue here. Oh my God, we have an issue. I, I did a lecture the other day, and I was talking about a, a woman that uh, unfortunately. She's this tragedy is stupid. Uh, she was uh, in Las Vegas when that shooter, went, you know, killed a bunch of people. She got shot in the head. She's holding on to her family, hits the ground. She's out of her body. Hold on. This woman got shot in the head by the shooter in Las Vegas? Yes. This was in the, that big massacre. Yeah, that was in Las yeah, Vegas yeah. not too long ago. Yeah, I know. And, I, uh, I, yeah. I know, I know the, the event, but you, and she, she survived? 
she survived. Yes, she has brain damage, but shot her in the head. And she's able to tell her story. She said she felt a big boom. Everything went black. Next thing you know, she's out of her body, hovering over her body. Now, if you look at that case study and you compare it to some of the literature, especially in Beyond UFOs, where it appears that entire scenarios have been designed by the phenomenon to dislodge the soul from the body. And then when that soul is out of it to, and this is one, one experience you said, by an intelligent electricity be taken to a certain undisclosed location and then threatened. What are we dealing with here? One individual was in a catastrophic car accident and uh, he left his body near death experience and, and, and he meets these beings and they tell him in no uncertain terms, you're going to die. And if you die, we'll have your soul. And uh, you have only one choice. Either do what we want you to do when we, when we want you to do it or, or we're going to kill you. Now, if you say yes to our demands, we'll replace you. We'll put you back in your body and we'll heal you up. And you'll wake up from this crash of thinking you're all good and, and thank God you survived. But we will come for a ransom. We'll knock on your door, and you're going to do what we want you to do. What kind of a species has the preternatural knowledge of the soul, can actually orchestrate events to pluck it out of the body, how can fix the body, and then what are we dealing with here? It, it, it's, it's imperative for us to look at the information they're employing in their deception and ask ourselves, they know when people die. Betty Luca was told by the beings when their ki her kids were going to die. And she actually forgot it. This is incredible. She forgot it. Her body remembered the post-traumatic stress of that revelation. Lack of sleep, panic attacks, vomiting, headaches. She goes to uh, the doctor. The doctor says, there's nothing wrong with you physically. Did you experience something that, that's just, I don't know, a tragedy or something? She goes, I don't know. So she goes to uh, a psychiatrist. They do uh, regressive memory sessions. Then, then uh, Ray Fowler, another researcher that I was working with, gets a phone call at three in the morning. Ray, I discovered what they've been trying to hide. What is it? They're going to kill my kids. My kids are going to die. My kids are going to kill them. My kids are going to die. And Michael, they did. That's, that's even tough. if, well, again, even if we look at the the amount of information they're employing, it's it's it's, it's glaringly obvious. Uh, uh, was it a uh, Ted Rice? Ted Rice. His, again, I, I mentioned this earlier in the show. Uh, his grandmother was uh, abducted along with him. This entity went to to have sex with her. She says, "I've never made love to anybody but my husband, and he's dead." Oh. And then in their minds, they go, doo -doo 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 -doo. you mean this guy? So this is why I say, okay, the reason we believe they're aliens is because they've told us that. But if we're going to believe they're aliens, we got to believe they're Jesus, Muhammad, and Mickey Mouse as well. Or is it possible that there's something darker at play? So... Going back there, they told her her kids were going to die, and she forgot that they told her her what happened there. Did she did she remember she, after after the event or what happened there? Absolutely. So there are two different memories at play. Uh, in many cases, they will tell experiencers something and then tell them you won't remember this, right? You won't remember it. But somewhere in the mind, it's weird. The two different kinds of memory archives at the, that exist simultaneously. And yet the body, when the spirit, if the soul got back into the body, it was like the body registered the trauma that the soul itself remembered. Now, this is going to blow your mind, okay? There, again, there's this different, there's two different memories coinciding simultaneously. One's going to forget, the other one will remember. This is weird. Now, getting into Ian Stevenson's work, uh, Ian Stevenson was dealing with near-death experiences, past lives. He was dealing with people who would give, the, give him, okay, my name was, you know, 
I don't know, Patricia or whatever. I died at 35 and I was, uh, you know, I, I lived in Ohio and I, I worked at a grocery store. And, and they said, okay, well, well, how did you die? Okay, you know what? I got shot in the neck or something. I broke my neck or whatever. I got run over by a car. And so uh, the death blow of the body that they left manifested in their new body as a birthmark. There's a memory of the soul that's manifesting through the skin. Dealing with two different memories here. I'll go a step further. When that remote viewer was put back into his body, there were manifestations, skin anomalies that manifested on his body to the surface. Does this make more sense? There's two different memories here. And I think they're hacking one of them and then hiding it from what, what we're dealing with right now. Even more than that, when Betty Luca was taken in the middle of the night, they peeled her soul out of her body. They told her body, her, her soul different things, educated her soul in different things, and then told her, when you get back into your body, there are certain things you will not remember. Stuff we don't want you to remember yet. You know, it's weird. But then when she got back into her body, when the soul got back into that physical container, as they called it, her skin began to manifest anomalies. So what we're looking at is the possibility of two different memories existing simultaneously. And I think in that case, her body was manifesting a memory in that she'd forgotten. And that's why she had to access it all. And then when she realized that the amount of trauma she went through you know what I mean? It measured, it equated to exactly what she was going through with her PTSD. Well, it's, um, you know, the whole memory thing is, you know, it, it ties right back into the, you know, Dark City, the movie. You know, in the movie as well, when John, John Terry, you know, he goes through the wall and he reveals like the passage in, into space before the, the detective uh, Bumstead, Bernstead, before he he falls through it, Bumstead, I think his name is. I keep forgetting his name, but he falls through the wall, and it's almost like a metaphor for for people falling through through into the into 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 another reality, into the true reality. What what is there? Absolutely. So when when okay, so I'm gonna ask you this. Um, you you like Nigel Kerner, right? I interviewed one of my last interviews. Well, the interview before the last one, I interviewed uh, Doctor uh, Silverman, and he was a he was a friend of Nigel Kerner, and he was really into, you know, he's really excuse me, he's really into you know the the sense of having a spirit and that there is a spirit mm -hmm. there, and we all have a soul, and that's what makes us divine. That's what makes us special, that we have a, that we have a soul. Is your, do you think that we have a soul? Do you think that, do you think spirit, that we're connected to spirit through our souls and that maybe these parasites, these, I don't want to say aliens or demons, but this mm -hmm. phenomena that they lack what we, what, what we have? Well, in demon, demonological theory, the first hypothesis presented was that they were after our essence. And so that's why in Ezekiel 13, it said, okay, they were after our souls, the soul hunters. Uh, and then later on in the Middle Ages, they began to believe that it wasn't just our, our essence, but it was our attributes that they're after. And that's when the hybridization program came into play. Nigel Kerner talks about that the biological entities or biological avatars, robots in a sense that have no real knowledge. Uh, he hypothesizes like a camera. It could take a picture, but it doesn't know what it took we look at it and say, okay, that's right. That's what his hypothesis stated. Um, but there is, uh, I don't know that they are after the soul. Um, I believe again, that what we're looking at are descriptions of some sort of program. And in our human ingenuity, we will, we will run to, okay, this is what they want, this is what they're after. I know that's what they're looking at. Uh, I know that uh, Betty Luca was basically in a coroner or was he yeah, as a coroner's office or, or some kind of morgue where bodies were everywhere. And whatever these molters is what I call the molters, they walked over and they held their hand over the body. Remember that? Sleep. Remember that? On Dark City. It's incredible, man. And so they held the hand over the body and suddenly this ball of light left. 
Now, whatever that ball of light is, soul maybe, soul maybe. I, I know that in the 16th century, when exorcists were interrogating the possessing entity, the parasite, they would often ask uh, about its evolution, right? And, and so they would have different measures of loops. And so the idea was that the older the consciousness became, the more evolved it got bigger. And so they would often ask the, the parasite, okay, are you the size of a chicken egg or an ostrich egg? Isn't that funny? Uh, but, you know, so, so I don't know what they're doing. I, I know that they're running tests. I know that they're self-replicating. Uh, but your question is more pointed than that. I don't believe I have a soul. I believe I am a soul. I have a body. Mm. Right? And that it, I think more than anything, that's what they are and what they do is they take over bodies. And there is something to say about that narrative. Uh, in biblical antiquity, uh, they believe these beings to be unclean spirits, spirits that had no body. And so what we're looking at the hybridization program, uh, me and another research partner, is that, is it possible we're looking at souls without bodies and bodies without souls, which, again, we're landing right back in the dark city. Because Alex Rojas said that these beings were basically corpses possessed by a parasitic entity. And that's why when the corpse died, the host dies, they have to move on to something else. Hmm. Which, hello, hybridization program. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. The, um, it's like... It's like in the Bible when they say, you know, when when they leave, they, you know, in the movie, what was interesting as well that I found interesting was there was a comment in it when, you know, when the Schrieber is swimming in the swimming pool, he's allowed to go and swim for a few mm -hmm. minutes every day or every week or something like that, because he works with the strangers and one of the strangers comes and visits him in the swimming pool. And he says to him, I don't like coming here because there's too much moisture, right? Yep. Because yeah, there's, there's, there's too much. It's like, well, it's like in the Bible where they say that, you know, when a, when a demon goes out of a person, he's in a dry place, or excuse me, when a spirit, an unclean spirit is, it, it mm -hmm. goes out of a person, they, they're in a dry place, you know, mm -hmm. seeking rest. That, yeah. Yeah. And um, you know that was that was kind of um, interesting in the in the movie, and at the end as well, when when the guy he opens the door and he goes out, he and he sees the sunlight, and the sunlight is there, the ultimate reality, I guess you can look in, you can look at the symbol as that. But mm -hmm. what else, so what else did you find interesting about the movie before we wrap it up? What else did you find interesting? Oh, man, I, I just. I think it's an incredible, first of all, I think the implant, another aspect of it that blew my mind. I mean, if there's ever a person that I would love to have a pint with, it would be Alex Ross. Because in order for them not just to have exterior control of us, they had to implant themselves into them. Now, we see this in UFO abduction and even in demonic possession, where there are two memories in one body, two languages in one body. Uh, you know, I heard one, one account of a woman in, in the 16th century possessed by an entity, but knew what a baguette or baguette tasted like in France. Never been to France. Those are imprinted memories, implanted memories into that individual, which is exactly what they were doing. Uh, is, you know, we've got to place us into them. And so in, in order to gain more access to us, they begin not just to implant us into them, but they begin to implant them into us. And there was this, 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 this symbiotic, and dare I say, especially within the hybrid phenomenon, there's a symbiotic and embryotic relationship that we have with them. And it's this correlation of, of our beliefs and what they want us to believe. And okay, we're going to conjure them. Meanwhile, they're conjuring us. Who pull, who implanted the thought to conjure them? You know, that's really where we're at. But I think that was incredible because it goes right down the alley of uh, the teraphim in Mesopotamian literature. Did I ever tell you about the teraphim? No. Carving the name. Oh my God. So, in light of these beings allegedly being corpses in Dark City, uh, necromancy or a technological necromancy. 
uh, was being employed in biblical antiquity. They would pull up corpses, recently deceased men and women. They would take a piece of metal, heat it up to where it's semi-melted, and they would carve incantations into it. They would carve the names of entities into it and then implant it into the body of a corpse. Well, I thought implants were a part of ufology. They are. Where I'm going? But it's not limited to that. If we go back in the Mesopotamia, we have accounts that are exactly what we're doing with. And so, so what, by, why are they implanting this? Why are they implanting it into the corpse to to reanimate the? the Absolutely. The idea was that there, again, there was some kind of technological necromancy where the memory of that unclean spirit that had the disability of being, it would merge with the metal. And by implanting it into the corpse, it would then stretch its consciousness into that biological avatar. And now it's looking through that individual's eyes. We have seen that over. Matter of fact, my friend, They've even told us that's why they're doing this in UFO abductions. I mean, incredible. I'll give you one account and then I'll shut up because I know I ramble. But in Beyond UFOs, there's a, like a 12 year old boy who's sitting in his room and he's saying, you know what? He's telling a story I've been being taken since I was young. He said, and I have implants. And he said, it's just weird. Sometimes my implant will turn on, like what the streamer says. Sometimes it'll go off. Other times, and this is where we get into terrorism as well, the implant itself is alive. What? Why? It's that consciousness. It's that entity. It's that presence that's stretching into the body. But anyways, this young man says that just like in his youth, he's going to bed at night and he feels the strange presence envelop the room. Next thing he knows, implants turned on and he, in his vision, in his mind, he's looking out of a ship that he's approaching his own house. He's looking through their eyes as they're coming to kidnap him. In his question, the question that ringed in his ears was if, if, if I'm looking through their eyes, who was looking through mine? So this is not new technology. It's, it's modern interpretations of an ancient phenomenon. You know, there's, I forget the doctor's name, um, Benjamin, you know, there was a doctor, he died a few years ago, and he was really into mm -hmm. the whole implants, and, um, you know, about Roger, the, Rog, yeah, Ro, what was his second name, Roger, Lear, Lear, Roger, Lear, that's Roger him, Lear. Ro, yeah, Dr. Roger Lear, and he was always on about the implants, so have you, have you researched any of his stuff? I have, and is one of his conclusions was that, that was that there, there's something alive about this entity like when when it was on and they kept trying to pull it out it would move away from the device they were using mm. and, and again it's new to new researchers new to people who read new research but when you get into the technology they've been employing for thousands of years uh, it's many cases the same technology, same programs, same masks. And, and I'm afraid that if we don't evolve and go two or three steps ahead and look at it from a macro lens, we're going to be stuck in this simulation in the dark city, not realizing that the, they're afraid of us waking up, not afraid of us going to sleep. They're afraid that we're going to wake up one day and realize how powerful we are. Well, thank you very much, Nate, for being here tonight. I really enjoyed listening to you and really enjoyed the conversation. And it's always great to catch up with you. And I just want to thank you for, for being here. And I, where can people find your stuff? Where can they find you now? Are you, you're still on Instagram, I know. Uh, where, where else can people find you? Uh, I'm on YouTube and Instagram. And uh, that's really where I'm at. I got off of Facebook. You can still message me on the Facebook app. But I, I'm no longer active on there but you know what it's been a pleasure and uh, I, I i have this uh complex of rambling and if i if, and i bring it up because i'm afraid i do and i apologize if i did deny there's so many aspects of it that i try to put together and sometimes dude, you, do, dude you don't you, you you don't ramble what you what you say is very very insightful very interesting Thank so you, so when you when you, you're not rambling i promise you that i promise you that thank you my friend yeah nice thank you
See you soon. All right, brother. See you soon, buddy.